Good afternoon. My name is Vanessa Grubin. I am the director of the Center for Health Law Policy and Ethics at the University of Ottawa, and I'm delighted to be joining you all this afternoon for this RSC event. The RSC is, uh, as I've mentioned, hosting this event, and their offices are located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. From coast to coast to coast, we are grateful to acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, First Nations, and Métis people, and recognize the dozens of languages and cultures Indigenous peoples have brought that enrich what many call Turtle Island. Canada's National Academy, the Royal Society of Canada, recognizes Canada's leading intellectuals, scholars, researchers, and artists, and mobilizes them in open discussion and debate to advance knowledge, encourage integrated interdisciplinary understandings, and address issues that are critical to Canada and Canadians. Today's event is being recorded and will be posted online on the RSC website following the event. So I'm delighted to be here today to discuss the findings of our report, Urgent and Long Overdue, Legal Reform and Drug Decriminalization in Canada. The report is the product of an amazing team of experts from a range of different disciplines and backgrounds. And today I'm joined by a few of my co-authors. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, colleague Mary Lou Gagnon is not able to join us today, but I'm going to briefly in introduce my other panelists. Today, we're first going to hear from Matthew Bonn. Matthew is a drug user advocate and freelance writer. He sits on the board of the International Network of Health and Hepatitis in Substance Users, is a social media editor for the International Journal of Drug Policy, and a knowledge translator with the Dr. Peters AIDS Foundation. He helped open Atlantic Canada's first overdose prevention site. We'll then hear from Professor Martha Jackman, who teaches constitutional law at the Faculty of Law, the University of Ottawa in the French Common Law Program. Professor Jackman was a consultant to the Auditor General of Canada, the Canadian Bar Association Healthcare Task Force, the Royal Commission on New Reproductive Technologies, and the Commission on the Future of Healthcare in Canada. She's also a past board member of the Canadian Health Coalition and has acted as legal counsel in charter test cases, including before the Supreme Court of Canada in Eldridge and British Columbia and Shaoli in Quebec. Her research interests include socioeconomic rights, equality, and health. And our third panelist is Dr. Elaine Hishka, who's an associate professor and Canada research chair in health systems innovation at the University of Alberta School of Public Health and the scientific director of the Inner City Health and Wellness Program. Her program of health systems and services research is focused on advancing a public health approach to substance use in Canada. She works closely with service providers, health authorities, people with lived experience of substance use, and all levels of government to identify and evaluate and scale systems innovations for improving health outcomes and advancing health equity. Between 2019 and 2023, Dr. Hishka co-chaired Health Canada's Expert Advisory Group on Safer Supply, and between 2017 and 2019, she served as the co-chair of the Alberta Minister of Health's Opioid Emergency Response Commission. Before I turn it over to Matthew, I'd just like to say a few words uh, about the report and its recommendation. The impetus of the report was the profound impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on people who use drugs. Canada was already in the midst of an overdose epidemic stemming from the toxicity of the illicit drug market but it was significantly exacerbated by the pandemic due to a number of factors, including the significant restrictions on access to various health and social services. As a result, we found ourselves in the midst of two overlapping public health crises, which had a disproportionate impact on already at-risk populations. Our report fo focuses on the impact of sections four and five of the CDSA, which criminalize personal possession of people who use drugs. The report considers the constitutionality of these provisions and offers a series of recommendations for decriminalization in Canada. Importantly, the criminalization of illicit drugs places people at a great risk of several harms. And these harms are disproportionately experienced by those who are most marginalized in our society, including Black, Indigenous, and other racialized persons and women. Not only does the criminalization of drugs have long-lasting impacts on life and health, 
It also generates stigma across systems and social spheres, which in turn increases shame and isolation and increases the harms associated with drug use. At a systemic level, it's been shown that criminalization deters implementation of and access to harm reduction services, which have been proven to reduce harms and save lives. In short, the relationship between criminalization and harms for people who use drugs is many fold, and it produces a range of health inequities and injustices across generations. The report considers whether in light of these harms, section four, sections four and five violate sections 15 and seven of the charter. And our legal analysis finds that they do, and Martha will speak in more detail about the charter shortly. Because criminalization interferes with the ability of people who use drugs to access health and social services, exposes them to a toxic, unregulated illicit drug supply, worsens the inequities related to the social determinants of health and results in stigma and discrimination, they violate an individual's section seven rights to life and security of the person. And that violation is not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Moreover, criminalizing possession violates section 15 of the charter because it results in discrimination against people who depend on illegal drugs, a legal, uh, legally recognized ground of disability. And though impact of those sections are disproportionately experienced by members of marginalized communities, numerous researchers have demonstrated a pattern of overrepresentation of Black and Indigenous people in drug arrests and convictions. In order to reduce these harms, our report makes a series of recommendations aimed at decriminalizing personal possession in Canada. Importantly, for any law reform to be meaningful and effective, it's imperative that lawmakers be attentive to the law reform process and ensure that the voices of those who are affected participate throughout the process. So to ensure effective law reform, we first recommend that the components of a Canadian decriminalization model be founded on five pillars. These include first, implementing a national approach to decriminalization by the federal government. Second, reducing the discretion of police officers in relation to enforcement of any new or revised laws to eliminate the potential for uh, discriminatory police or prosecutorial bias. Third, accepting sharing and splitting of drugs in a wide range of settings, both inside and outside safe consumption sites. Fourth, addressing concerns about setting legal thresholds as a regulatory tool. And fifth, establishing a process for the expungement of criminal records related to drug use. We recommend that the federal government adopt a, a three-stage approach to decriminalizing possession for personal use. Stage one, entails the immediate introduction of a series of policy changes that would result in the non-application of the criminal law through immediate changes to the prosecutorial guidelines. Stage two consists of a series of amendments to sections four and five of the CDSA, including the repeal of section 4.1, which prohibits personal possession. And stage three endorses the recommendations of the expert task force on substance use that all psychoactive substances be brought under one federal legislative framework, namely harmonizing the CDSA, the Tobacco and Vaping Products, the Cannabis Act, and others, which we acknowledge would re will require a longer period of deliberation and drafting. I want to close my brief remarks by emphasizing that decriminalization alone is not enough to reduce the harms faced by people who use drugs. We need to move our efforts outside of criminal prohibition and towards human rights and health-oriented regulation. As I've mentioned, access to harm reduction services and other health services, such as opioid agonist treatment and access to safer supply, as well as social supports, are absolutely critical for combating the toxic drug crisis. I'm now going to turn to Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa, and it was such a great job at just, um, you know, speaking to the report and our recommendations. And I just want to say thank you to the Royal, Royal Society of Canada for asking us to do this webinar and to do the report. I'm going to speak um, briefly to five different points. I'm going to speak to the threshold limit and the importance of that, um, including uh, elements such as splitting and sharing. Uh, in a decriminalization approach, uh, the engagement of people who use drugs, uh, moving beyond uh, decriminalization into regulation or legalization of drugs, 
and this this idea of the status quo, and I think that's what we're all in, is, is a lot of people still support the criminalization of drugs. So when we talk about the threshold limit, it's, it's extremely important uh, to have a threshold limit that's uh, very high, and it, it actually is in conjunction with how people um, buy drugs. You know, right now in, in British Columbia, the threshold limit is two and a half grams. Um, and people just typically don't buy drugs like that. You know, a lot of times people buy drugs in, in points, grams, eight balls, which is three and a half grams, five to 10 gra grams or ounces. You know, sometimes people who use drugs, not everybody who uses drugs uh, is living in poverty. Uh, sometimes people who use drugs are a little bit, uh, have some money and they may just want to buy an ounce of cocaine to get a better deal and not have to, uh, you know, buy a daily amount of drugs. So, you know, when we when we're talking about decriminalization, it's important that we make sure we set a threshold limit that's uh, extremely high so we don't get into this approach where we're just going to uh, start to criminalize people who are using just over this amount of drugs, you know, and I'm not saying that, um, you know, there's there aren't certain elements of drug use that should not be criminalized, you know, so when I think about threshold limits and, you know, activities that may still be criminalized, I think about things like importing or exporting drugs or the manufacturing of drugs. But I think if we look at the possession of drugs and the possession for the traffic or possession for the purpose of trafficking of drugs, uh, we don't want to like get stuck in this way where, okay, well, we're going to stop uh, criminalizing people who are possessing drugs and just start criminalizing people who are trafficking drugs because trafficking drugs could mean like splitting and sharing drugs or, you know, just buying in bulk for, for a whole bunch of people that, you know, you may have the connection and you just go and buy the drugs. Um, so, yeah, it's it's extremely important. And, you know, we need to look at, you know, uh, as Vanessa said, like a national kind of decriminalization approach and with realistic elements on the threshold limit. Next thing I want to talk about is um, the splitting and sharing of drugs. Um, even up until a couple of years ago, uh, it was very recently that the splitting and sharing of drugs have been decriminalized in overdose prevention sites. Um, and it wasn't done without the, the hard work of uh, a lot of people who use drugs working with the Dr. Peter Center to kind of do this uh, evaluation, look at different um, risks and harms of splitting and or of not being able to split and share and a lot of times people would go into an overdose prevention site they would split and share or they would have to be forced to kind of go outside of the site to split and share their drugs or do it in a in a way that wasn't uh wasn't healthy you know like so people would be forced to further stigma stigmatization forced to further criminalization on the streets um, when essentially these places should remain safe places for people who use drugs. And, you know, if you really want to split and share drugs, you should have a scale and you should be able to, uh, you know, weigh out the, the right amount and, and give it to somebody. The next thing I want to talk about is engaging people who use drugs. Um, and, you know, it's essential for any kind of decriminalization effort to work. Um, people who use drugs are not homogenous and, you know, there's a, we all have a wide variety of diverse backgrounds, but, you know, people who use drugs particularly do. So we just can't have one person on these committees or one person kind of, uh, speaking for the voice of people who use drugs. We need to have people with a wide range of diverse backgrounds, including ethnicity, gender, uh, socioeconomic status and their substance use patterns. Like we don't just want a whole bunch of people who use opioids. We want people who use opioids and stimulants and psychedelics uh, and that come from all different backgrounds, um, but all want the same thing and they just want to stop being criminalized. And, you know, I think um, this could be done in, in a, a wide variety of ways. You know, you could do this by hiring people who use drugs to write a decriminalization policy or to analyze it, you know, you could hire them as policy analysts. Um, you could hire somebody or, or multiple people as decriminalization representatives. Um, and you could hire them as evaluators or researchers. You know, and there's a lot of people who use drugs may not like this role um, and, you know, working for the government. But I think, you know, a lot of people uh, would like it if you gave them the chance. And, you know, I think, you know, this should be done 
Uh, you should have somebody just almost like you you do with politicians, right? Like you have somebody, you have a provincial politician, you have a local politician, a federal politician. And I think, you know, if we really want this to work, uh, we're going to hire people who use drugs to make sure that these policies are implemented effectively. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the need to really consider moving beyond decriminalization into regulation or legalization. And and you know, I think um, it's going to it's going to hard to ever be able to completely eliminate people buying and trading and selling um, regulated substances, let alone unregulated substances. You know, for example, people still buy, sell, and trade cigarettes and alcohol, um, not as much as they they used to back in the day. But you know, there's still you know you see a lot of different cases, especially with um, nicotine and tobacco and, and cigarettes that, you know, a lot of times these people, you can get it a lot cheaper and they sell it. Um, you know, a lot of times it's for cost, but there's other reasons such as accessibility as well. You know, if somebody's going to deliver you a, a box of cigarettes and you aren't mobile, then, um, you know, that could be a reason why you do it. But, you know, I think we need to really start to this conversation on moving beyond uh, decriminalization into legalization and regulation because we'll never get there if we don't we'll, if we don't try. And then lastly, I'm just going to speak briefly to the status quo that we're kind of uh, all living in. And you know the status quo is really the status quo is supporting the criminalization of drugs, which essentially means people are supporting an increasingly unregulated toxic drug supply, underground criminal organizations, cartels and murder, you know, and we need to move away from that. You know, it's extremely important that when we say like, if you, if, you know, if you're talking to somebody and they say, you know, like drugs should be criminalized, you know, you got to tell them what they are supporting by saying that. And, you know, we got to move them away from that and, and get them to see uh, the importance of life-saving evidence-based harm reduction services, such as safe consumption sites and opioid agonist therapy and safe supply programs as well as, you know, these evidence-based decriminalization policies. There's an abundance of evidence from different countries around the world, uh, such as Portugal. And with that, I will pass it over to my next panelist. Thanks, Matthew. So we'll pass it over to Martha next. Um, if you've got questions, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A and uh, we'll take some questions uh, at the end of the panelists' remarks. Martha? Thanks, uh, Vanessa. And thank you, everyone who's taken the time this afternoon to listen in uh, to this web webinar on a really timely topic. Our uh, report argues, as Vanessa pointed out, that the prohibition on possession under Section 4.1 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act is unconstitutional. And I, in my brief remarks, I, I'm going to outline the legal basis for this conclusion. So Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and it states that you can only be deprived of those rights in a way that's fundamentally just. And the courts have concluded that restrictions on rights that are arbitrary, that are in the sense that they don't actually achieve their objectives, that are grossly disproportionate because the adverse impact on those who are affected vastly outweighs any public benefit that the rest of Canadian society might gain, or restrictions on life, liberty, and security that are discriminatory, all of those the courts have concluded are fundamentally unjust. And as our report details, and Matt has already, and Elaine will speak to the evidence on this, it is absolutely clear that the prohibition, the criminal prohibition on possession of drugs violates life. Uh, it causes people to die. It violates liberty. It puts people at threat of imprisonment. And it violates security of the person. The harms in terms of physical and mental health and well-being are extreme and well-documented. And our report also explains to what extent the prohibition is arbitrary. 
its purported objective is to promote public health and safety. And it's absolutely clear and well recognized now across Canada, not only people who use drugs, academics and researchers in this area, public health organizations, and even police associations, along with many municipalities and public officers of health across Canada, have documented and underscored the degree to which their prohibition on possession isn't simply neutral in terms of the objectives of public health and safety that are supposed to underlie the, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, they actually seriously undermine those objectives, so they're arbitrary. Again, the evidence is clear that the restriction on the criminalization of possession is grossly disproportionate in terms of the little or no benefit that we, the members of the public, derive relative to the extreme harm it causes for those that are affected. And the criminalization of uh, possession of drugs is clearly discriminatory in terms of its adverse impact on a number of uh, disadvantaged groups in Canadian society. Uh, in 2003, the criminalization of possession of cannabis was challenged, and the Supreme Court at that time found that that restriction on life, liberty, and security was fundamentally just, and in fact, could also be justified under Section 1. In the Insight case, as you, you probably already know, the Supreme Court of Canada came to the opposite conclusion in terms of the Harper government's decision not to renew the exemption under Section 56 of the uh, Controlled Drugs and Substances Act that allowed the Insight Clinic in Vancouver to keep offering safe injection services. But the court in the Supreme Court in the Insight case was reluctant to uh, even address the argument that Section 4.1 of the Act, the, the criminalization of, of possession, was unconstitutional because the court felt at that time that Section 56 of the Act, which allows the minister to grant exemptions from the prohibition under Section 4, operated as a safety valve. And what the court found at that time is that the problem wasn't with the criminalization so much as is the minister's arbitrary behavior in refusing to exercise his powers under Section 56. And in the intervening decade, especially with the COVID pandemic, it is pretty clear that our current reality is far worse in terms of the impact of criminalization and also its irrationality. And looking at varying levels of municipal and provincial government opposition across Canada to the idea of exemptions, and also the increasingly toxic drug supply, it's simply not tenable to suggest anymore that, prohib that prohibition, criminal prohibition of possession can withstand constitutional scrutiny under Section 7 of the Charter. In terms of Section 15 of the Canadian Charter, it guarantees every person in Canada equal protection and equal benefit of the law without discrimination, including based on racism, sex, disability, which has been read to include uh, illness and um, drug dependence. And Section 15 doesn't simply um, prohibit bad intent, so laws that are intentionally or formally discriminatory. Section 15 also prohibits laws that have discriminatory effects in the sense that they reflect, perpetuate, or worsen the disadvantage for the affected groups. And again, Matthew has spoken to this, Elaine will too. The evidence of the systemically discriminatory impact of criminalization on Indigenous people in Canada, on racialized people in Canada, the disproportionate impact on women, not to speak of the discriminatory impact on people who use and depend on substances is clearly discriminatory within the meaning of Section 15 in the existing Supreme Court jurisprudence. Section 1 of the Canadian Charter does allow for justifiable limits on individual rights. But for a limit to be justified, not only does the objective have to be important, but the limit has to be rational, it has to minimally impair the rights of those who are affected, and it has to be proportionate 
in its effects. And once again, as our report documents at length, while the objective of protecting public health and safety is an important one, prohibiting criminalizing possession is an irrational means of achieving that objective. It is far from a minimal impairment of the rights of those affected. And again, Matthew has outlined a number of, of uh, measures that would be far more consistent with the human rights of people who use drugs. And our report does the same. And again, criminalization of possession is grossly disproportionate. The evidence in our report uh, makes it clear that there is no longer any way that the criminalization of possession can be justified under Section 1 of the Charter. And in particular, the idea that the Supreme Court accepted in Insight that the availability of exemptions under Section 56, so the Minister of Health's ability to grant exemptions from Section 4.1, is simply not an effective way to uh, prevent the harms that criminalization has occurred um, at a national level. Likewise, the recent reforms the, the Liberal government has adopted under Bill C-5 that expands police and prosecutorial discretion to issue warnings and referrals rather than charging and prosecuting people in no way addresses the unconstitutional effects of the criminalization. And we understand in a, in a society uh, prone to racism with deep uh, colonial uh, deep effects and ongoing effects of colonialism. The idea of increasing police and prosecutorial discretion is the last thing that's going to solve a problem of systemic equality. So as, uh, again, as Matthew has outlined and as uh, Elaine will speak to, there is no question that going forward, the prohibition on possession under Section 4.1 needs to be, it needs to be abolished. And going forward, we need to adopt a public health and a human rights, charter rights infused approach to um, drug policy in Canada, including the entire issue of ensuring that people have access to safe drugs, which create is um, has many of the same, raises many of the same charter issues in terms of the disparate treatment of drugs that are considered legal and drugs that are considered illegal in terms of how we protect the safety of people who use them. So thanks very much. Thank you, Martha. Over to you, Elaine. Thanks, Vanessa. And thank you, everyone uh, who's spoken already. And also thank you, everyone who's made time to attend this webinar. This is um, a very important issue, and it really is about uh, writing fundamental inequities in our society. And so I appreciate the interest today. So I'm doing, joining today from Edmonton, which is on Treaty 6 territory, traditional lands of diverse Indigenous people, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Salto, and Anishinaabe and Inuit people. Um, and I want to focus my remarks today on kind of uh, some context for the uh, the re legal reform report that we put together and um, really kind of uh, zoom out on the issue so that we can have a common understanding of how we got into the position we are in and how and perhaps generate some understanding around how legal reform is important for getting out of the situation, but it's not uh, it's not enough on its own. So um, in order to solve a complex challenge, I think it's really important that we all have a common understanding of the um, immediate antecedent events that led to the challenge. And so I just want to really emphasize that um, the reason we have the toxic drug crisis that we are currently experiencing um, is increasingly well understood and the preponderance of evidence is indicating that the exponential increase in deaths has been the result of fundamental and presumably permanent shifts in the illegal drug supply which have made using drugs much more dangerous than ever before. So it is not the result of a significant increase in the prevalence of addiction or of opioid use disorder. Instead, well-intended efforts to reduce non-medical prescription opioid use and associated diversion beginning in 2011, 2012, led to a rapid reduction in prescribing, um, which actually translated into a 50% reduction in the total population flow of prescription-grade opioids in Canada by 2018. However, 
this uh, reduction in prescription opioid availability did not correspond with a reduction in deaths. Instead, we actually observed mortality surge as the illegal drug market moved to fill this gap with highly toxic, clandestinely produced novel synthetic opioids. Complicating the situation further has been increasing rates of stimulant co-use and contamination of opioid products with benzodiazepines, uh, xylazine, and other sedatives. And as the report discusses, the situation, which was quite bad in 2019, was further exacerbated um, by the onset of the pandemic. So increased deaths associated with supply disruptions, increasing volatility of the illegal drug market, um, and or were compounded with increasing socioeconomic precarity and more people using the loan and decreased access to services. As a result, rates of fatal drug deaths um, substantially increased during the pandemic period, and they have not meaningfully declined as the emergency um, has ended and some of the economic and service impacts have been resolved. In Alberta, for example, we're now on track to see close to 2,000 fatal drug deaths um, once the 2023 numbers are finalized. And this compares to 91 drug deaths in 2011 before the emergence of novel synthetic opioids. We've actually now lost 10,160 Albertans to toxic drugs. And to put this number in perspective, that's um, 3,861 more people who have died from toxic drugs in my province um, than have died from COVID-19. Most people dying are young and middle-aged, and many are First Nations people who, as a result of colonization, racism, and discrimination, die at seven times the rate of non-First Nations people in Alberta. And um, data certainly indicate that um, this is the case in BC and Ontario as well. The potential years of life loss and the impacts on surviving children, parents, families, and friends and communities are enormous and they're devastating. So that's a situation that we're currently in. How do we get out of the situation or where should we go from here? So reversing the trends we're seeing will require an evidence-informed public health response that we have yet to see anywhere in Canada. The pandemic demonstrated how coordinated and well-resourced public health efforts can achieve rapid advances in science and avert substantial morbidity and mortality over time. We need a similar societal response to toxic drugs to save lives, promote health equity, and reduce pressure on health systems, and avert billions of dollars in lost economic productivity that are currently attributable to toxic drug deaths. So critical components of a national coordinated public health response include estimating the number of Canadians who are at risk of drug poisoning, which is, which is difficult to do currently, um, in part because drugs and possession remain criminalized and many people are unwilling to identify as someone who uses illegal drugs in public health surveillance. Um, and we need to expand proven interventions like opioid agonist treatment, which is medications such as buprenorphine um, or methadone, or hydro, uh, hydromorphone, um, diacetylmorphine, and supervised consumption services to ensure that we're meeting needs across the population. Currently, we have implemented service, these services, but it's um, unclear but unlikely that um, any jurisdiction in Canada has um, ensured adequate coverage to um, bring down deaths at the population level. It also includes acknowledging the reality that most people at risk for dying of drug poisoning in Canada do not meet criteria for opioid use disorder or addiction and will not routinely seek health care for drug use. So this means that we must continue to trial novel methods for prescribed and non-prescribed safer supply with the aim of reducing exposure to toxic drugs. So this means programs with services and other models that deliver um, pharmaceutical grade uh, drugs of known potency and quantity um, that match people's um, use preferences and needs as this core strategy for reducing the currently um, excessively high mortality we're seeing from toxic drugs. Equally important, we must address the underlying factors that increase vulnerability to drug-related harm. So this requires concerted efforts to improve the management of chronic pain and mental health conditions, improve health and social status of Indigenous people, and reduce rates of housing insecurity and poverty nationally. We need to also invest in implementing and evaluating community-wide universal prevention programs for children, youth, and families, which have a strong potential to reduce rates of early adolescent drug use and would pay dividends in many other realms of social life. So decriminalization would not only help reduce some of the well-documented harms of criminalization on people who use drugs, but also facilitate this coordinated public health response. By improving our ability to conduct population health surveillance and better understand the scope of the issue and the potential for various interventions to reduce morbidity and mortality. 
It would help encourage people who use drugs to seek substance use treatment when indicated. It would enable expansion and innovation of harm reduction services by reducing the need to engage in complex, time-consuming, and politicized processes to secure exemptions to the CDSA. And it would enable a shift in resources away from policing, prisons, and judicial responses to illegal drugs and towards the health and social sector, which would facilitate and enable additional investments in upstream approaches that prevent drug poisoning, substance use disorders, and drug-related harm. And I just want to end by um, discussing how decriminalization is an important legal reform, but it's not the only one that's required. And I think we need to start to have a broader conversation um, that recognizes that criminal prohibition has not been particularly effective for deterring illegal drug use, and an unregulated market has exacerbated, widely exacerbated, the harms of psychoactive substance use and contributed to organized crime and challenges to peace and security. In 2018, the Global Commission on Drug Policy, which was, comp was comprised of former heads of state and chaired by the late Kofi Annan, former Secretary General of the UN, published a report calling for regulation of currently illegal drugs. In the report, they state, the global conversation on drugs is moving from if to how regulation takes place, as well as underlying the, underlining the need to explore regulation options for some currently illegal drugs. This welcome progress also highlights the need to review and improve how alcohol, tobacco, and some other legal drugs are regulated. And the commission recommends a process of cautious, incremental, and evidence-informed regulation, starting with lower potency options available for purchase. And until we start to have broader conversations about what other legal reforms are possible um, to reduce morbidity and mortality, it is hard to imagine um, our ability, like a substantial ability to get a handle on the current toxic drug crisis. And so um, I'll just close by endorsing uh, this webinar as one of those options for having these conversations and turn it back to Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you all for your uh, wonderful um, comments. Uh, so just as a reminder, please do, uh, if you've got questions, please do post them in the Q&A and I will pose them uh, to the panelists. So that Q&A button is down at the bottom of your screen. And if you could use that rather than the chat function, we will um, be able to, to pass those questions along to Elaine, Martha, uh, and Matthew. So while we're, we're waiting for some of those questions, I just want to have a follow-up question actually for Elaine to get the discussion rolling. <laughs> Uh, so obviously decriminalization is one of the barriers to um, a coordinated national public health approach. Can you speak to some of the other barriers uh, that you see um, arising to, to embracing this, this kind of national uh, approach? That is a great question. Um, yeah, obviously stigma is a big one and you know, decriminalization is formal codification of stigma. So changing the law I think would help to um, improve our thinking around substance use and reduce stigma. Um, beyond that though, obviously um, there is a lack of resources invested in public health responses in general and in public health responses to substance use in particular. Um, we currently see at the federal level, for example, uh, there has been an increase in spending to address drugs, like and toxic drugs in particular in Canada, but 60% of that spending is allocated to law enforcement responses. And while law enforcement can play a role in helping to enforce, you know, like a public health oriented system, um, it shouldn't be the primary uh, focus. And, you know, we have pretty good evidence from the US uh, looking at the impacts of escalating law enforcement expenditures uh, over several decades. And, you know, the United States is the jurisdiction that spends the most on law enforcement to address drugs. They spend trillions of dollars. And um, during the period where they really were escalating uh, drug exp drug enforcement expenditures, um, we actually saw the price and potency of, or so the price of heroin declined and the potency of it increased. And so um, criminal prohibition has really failed by its own measure. And we really need to be thinking about how we can be reinvesting some of the excessive amount of money spent on um, these approaches that have not been yielding public health returns uh, in the health and social sector. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of investments in the health and social sector, not just in treatment, but in prevention um, and other initiatives would not just benefit in terms of reducing rates of problematic substance use, reducing drug poisoning. It would also help to improve outcomes in a whole host of other issues, because if we can invest more in communities, in families and in children, uh, you know, that's going to 
address a lot of other social issues that um, we're currently grappling with as a society. Super, thank you, Elaine. I also have a question for Martha. <laughs> um, so Martha, I'm hoping you can comment a little bit about sort of the patchwork of approaches uh, to decriminalization that have, uh, you know, popped up across the country. So we see certain jurisdictions um, uh, adopting decriminalization models through the exemption process under the CDSA. And I, I'm wondering if you can speak to um, the constitutional uh, questions or issues that arise from that patchwork of approaches. Uh, thanks for that question, Vanessa. It, it certainly, um, it, it, Definitely, the availability of the Section 56 exemption has been really significant in terms of the way the court in the Insight case approached this. Um, because if we, if there was, if the criminal, if criminalization was simply blanket criminalization, you know, it, it makes it easier to make the case that this is not a minimal impairment of the life, liberty, security, and equality rights of people who use um, drugs that are prohibited under the CDSA. But in in the same way as the Supreme Court has done in the, you know, in, in the Shaoli case around the idea, okay, is it, is it all right to prohibit access to private payment in Canada, the court said, well, you know, we've got the safety valve, people can, you know, people can go to the States, for example, to obtain care. Well, the perverse way that argument is translated in, in the substance use context is the idea, well, you know, the, the prohibition isn't such a problem. It's, it's the minister's arbitrary and irrational decision to refuse an exemption that's a problem. And what that has meant is that the federal government has continued to rely as a matter of national drug policy on a criminal regime where there really has to be demand and pressure from the community to decriminalize. So you end up with this complete patchwork situation where in the Insight case, you know, the Insight Clinic's request for an exemption was supported by a public officer of health in Vancouver, by the municipality, by the community. There was evidence there that, you know, the availability of Insight had not increased criminality, had decreased deaths. So there was lots of community buy-in. Even the police, you know, the police chief in Vancouver was supportive of the idea of Insight maintaining its exemption. Well, you move to another jurisdiction, be it the city of Ottawa at the same time and former um, Mayor Watson, the province of Ontario with Doug Ford, the province of Alberta now with uh, previously Premier Kenny and now Premier Smith. So if you have either political or community opposition to uh, an exemption, then that's effectively an irrational veto on um what the court has put forward in a way is is the constitutional remedy to this unconstant you know unconstitutional uh, human rights situation and it's it's as a, as a matter of, of constitutional law it's it's a it's a really problematic approach the idea that it's just you know one minister's bad faith and we may be back in that situation following the next election if the current polls hold you know, we may be back at square one trying to deal with a, with the federal health minister who is antagonistic to um, even safe supply, much less criminalization, and to have to start fighting that battle over when it's been so obvious for so long how harmful this policy is, it is really discouraging. And I think that is why, you know, we've called in the report for a consistent national approach and i would argue that anything else is unconstitutional thank you martha just a reminder that if you've got questions you can put them in the q a um matthew i've got a question uh for you um i'm wondering if you could um uh 
you know, if, if you could speculate on or, or give us some insights into um, how uh, decriminalization might discourage people from, uh, or how criminalization discourages people from accessing uh, health care. Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question, uh, Vanessa. And, you know, I think just from my personal experience, um, and being in and out of withdrawal management services and opioid agonist therapy uh, clinics, um, you know, the criminalization of drug use, you, you, you're just not really treated as a, a person. You're not treated with like the same level of health care as other people uh, have. So when you finally feel like you may need it or want to um, access that kind of service, um, you're going to think, well, maybe I don't deserve it, or maybe, you know, that the the social and the structural stigma internalizes it, and you start to believe it yourself. Um, but, you know, I think even with, like, if you look at how people who use drugs have been treated in healthcare settings and whatnot, like, um, a lot of the policies and procedures are designed to try to deter people from using drugs. So they have to come on opioid agonist therapy and they ha they can't use any outside drug, right? And people may still use stimulants. They may still use uh, psychedelics. They may still use any other like benzodiazepines, any other kind of substances. And they may just want to try to stop their opiate use. And, you know, by kind of coming on to this, like, criminalized uh, healthcare setting as an opioid agonist therapy clinic, even though they're, they're great and they, you know, they save lives, just the way that they have been implemented has been, been harsh, right? You know, it's a lot better now, but I remember when I first started methadone, like you used to get kicked off if you, um, if you were using other drugs, right? So I think all those aspects play a role into how someone ac accesses care. Thank you. Uh, so for everyone on the panel, whomever would like to get us started off on this question, um, I'm wondering if you can speak to whether or not you think, uh, you know, some have speculated that decriminalization is going to increase drug use and your thoughts on whether or not uh, that may or may, may or may not uh, occur. I'm not sure who would like to to tackle that one first. It looks like Elaine's. <laughs> I can start. Elaine's I can start to that. Yeah, I just want to make clear that decriminalizing, you know, possession and minor, even minor trafficking of substances, is not going to do anything to change the availability of those drugs currently in Canada. And so um, we wouldn't expect to see that the change in the legal status would lead to a dramatic increase or decrease in uh, the number of people using drugs. And if we look at experiences uh, internationally, you know, sometimes jurisdictions decriminalize the substance and the use of that goes down. Other times they decriminalize the substance and use of it goes up. And so what that suggests is that there are a number of other factors that really drive people's individual decisions to use substances um, that are, you know, go well beyond sort of whether the legal status of the drug. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's really important to emphasize that um, this is an important measure for addressing the inequitable um, enforcement of or use of criminal law against people who use drugs. But um, we do really need to talk about how we can shift the illegal drug market um, either through responsible regulation or through expansion of prescribed or non-prescribed safer supply models. And I think any efforts in that regard should really be focused on a public health approach, which is not, you know, widely available commercial distribution of psychoactive substances, um, but rather looking at how we can uh, provide safe access to all of these substances that people are routinely using um, in a way that uh, doesn't promote initiation into use and doesn't um, promote, you know, excessive use, but uh, is under public health orientation. And that's why the report also makes the recommendation to look at the CDSA and harmonizing how we approach all psychoactive substances, including alcohol and tobacco and cannabis um, under a public health oriented kind of model um, and not a commercial model. Thank you, Elaine. Matthew. Yeah, and very well said, Lane. And, you know, the way I, I look at it is, you know, people who use drugs use for a wide variety of internal and external factors. You know, people may be experiencing trauma or grief or, or burnout or loneliness, or um, they may just want to increase their pleasure or, you know, do something fun. Um, and there's all kinds of other factors like poverty and, um, you know, elements like that. And I think, you know, people don't just wake up one day and say, you know, I'm going to go smoke crack today or inject heroin today. You know, I think, you know, for, from my experience, a lot of people 
and you know start using drugs and you know like they may they may enjoy it they may use it and, and you know it, it it changes over a variety of times sometimes people eliminate their drug use sometimes people increase their drug use but i don't think um because of a policy or because of whatever reason people are going to just start increasing drugs right i think it there's has to be in, increasing their drug use i think there has to be a wide variety of factors and i think we do need to spend some time on you know, like, how do we talk to youth uh, about drug use? That's when I started using drugs. That's when a lot of people start using drugs. And, you know, we can't just have this just say no approach. You know, we got to really uh, talk to them about the the risks and the, the benefits of drug use and try to encourage them if they are wanting to experiment with drugs. Thank you. Martha. Yeah, and I, I guess I come at the question maybe from a different angle. So we have, you know, a very robust um, infrastructure in Canada for making sure that when people receive health services and pharmaceuticals, they're safe. You know, so the, the whole testing regime, the way they're dispensed, it's all designed to make sure that if you if you have an illness and you require a treatment or a pharmaceutical, what you're going to get, some may even be state subsidized with the move towards a national pharmacare regime. And at a minimum, you have a reasonable expectation that it's going to be safe. And then in parallel, we have a whole world of people uh, required not only to obtain their drugs on a black market, but who are criminalized for that with no effort made to make sure that, or little effort made to make sure that they are actually safe and that their health, mental and physical health needs are being met. And we don't say to people with, you know, that falling within the first regime anymore, well, it's your fault that you're sick. So, you know, as my daughter would say, bad life choice, mummy. We don't say that to people. Um, and we don't exclude people from receiving the treatment and pharmaceuticals that they need based on our, our prejudices around where that need comes from and ideas around choice and autonomy. And, and we have a completely hypocritical and, and really discriminatory understanding of a whole category of our you know fellow citizens and when you try and understand why this difference it can only be explained by by racism and stigma and it kind of it's it blows my mind as i say that we are now starting to hear again pre-election a whole new uh, growing rhetoric around this idea, you know, just say no to drugs, as Matthew said, like what a ridiculous thing to say, to say to it, to a teenager, like, or to anyone for that matter. So I think that, you know, I'm disappointed that there still is so much lack of public understanding. And I think, you know, one thing, if the, if COVID and the toxic drug supplies had one silver lining. It's that very few of us are untouched. Very few of us don't have a family member or a friend who has been a victim of toxic drugs. And I think that is increasing understanding. And it's really sad that that, that is what is going to be required to change public policy is that every person in Canada has somebody die in their family or circle friend before we change public health policy. I mean, that is nuts. And I don't think that's charter compliant, and I I hope that things will improve before they before they they start sliding backwards. 
Just to speak to that quickly, Vanessa, really quickly, um, I just wanted to highlight, we did do some research recently looking at um, public opinion on various drug policy options, and we looked at um, Albertan's perspective on uh, decriminalization, and, you know, we're probably thought to be the most socially conservative um, from a policy perspective jurisdiction in the country, and even here, uh, it's about almost 50% of people endorsed um, some form of decriminalization, and so I think um, we actually are at a place where many people understand the futility of of criminalizing drug uh, drug use and um, we need to build on that innate understanding and continue to have these conversations even if they're not politically um, popular or, you know uh, maybe are co con contributing like political rhetoric because the reality is most people understand that what we're doing is not working and um, you know this can really greatly facilitate a uh, move in a very in a health oriented and a more effective approach thank you I'd like to thank our panelists very much for their comments this afternoon, and thank you again to the RSC for hosting this webinar and supporting our team in drafting our report. It's been a pleasure, and I wish you all a very good Wednesday afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.